Hello everyone, we welcome you to the 10th episode of Choosing the Red Pill with Rajesh and Umar on the topic free speech and the state of Indian democracy. Free speech is called the foundation of any civil or liberal society and it is a very important milestone towards a civilized society. But right now we are seeing that not only in India but globally it is becoming increasingly difficult to express oneself and it is becoming increasingly difficult to crack a joke nowadays. And when we look at India especially, uh, things are moving towards bad and worse when it comes to expressing yourself. So sometimes free speech is uh, stifled because of political reasons or religious reasons or some other reasons. So today we have a Rutwij with us and I welcome him. I request uh, all of you to please watch this and give your views. So I welcome Rutwij. Hello Omar, glad to be here. Hi Rutwij, welcome back again on uh, Choosing the Red Pill. Nice to see you here. Thank you Rajesh. Yeah, let's have a freewheeling discussion uh, on uh, freedom of speech and state of Indian democracy. And uh, you know, we can keep asking questions to each other. It's not like the format is not like uh, Omar or me are going to ask you questions related to anything, but we all can ask questions to each other. That's the format for today. So, so let's start with you, Rutwej. You start with any questions that you have in your mind that you would like to ask Omar or me. So I'll, let's just take a general overview on what are your opinions on free speech. I mean, uh, generally there is a uh, polar uh, idea between in the masses that either free speech, free speech, I mean, uh, free speech should be absolute, or it can, or there should be severe restrictions on it. So I would like to start with that. What do you think on that? Okay, you ask me or Omar? Both of you. I mean, that I think that can be the foundation of this topic. Right. So, Omar, uh, please, you start with your answer. Okay, so I think uh, that when it comes to free speech, uh, first of all, uh, like it is said that free speech means the right uh, for everyone to say anything and standing up for something that I don't agree with, standing up for the right of someone else saying something. So, I think that is the foundation. Secondly, uh, I think the, the line that is drawn and the whole debate is about where to draw the line. I think the line should be drawn at uh, incitement of violence where uh, threats are being given because there it stops uh, being free speech and uh, turns into something, you know, violent uh, and, uh, you know, taking someone's life or physical harm. So I think apart from that, if someone is preaching anything, expressing oneself uh, or criticizing anything, uh, making jokes, making memes or cartoons or anything. So I think that is all covered under free speech. And if someone is offended over this, if someone doesn't like it, so it, there always is an option to ignore it or, you know, uh, move forward. So I think that is the principle that I think about. Rajesh. Right. For me, you know, uh, as Omar says, suggested, and uh, I completely agree with it. And in a different way, I'll put my point. Free speech means nothing at all if you don't agree in speech of people who you disagree with. So uh, if you don't give a chance to hear out to people who disagree with your opinions, then you are not standing for free speech at, at all. And since Rutu is asked, it, asked whether free speech is absolute or not, definitely there are restrictions on free speech and there should be. Uh, the distinction should be based not on hurt principle, but rather on harm principle. Uh, let me explain this in a bit. Hurt is basically your sentiments are hurt, right? Harm is actual harm to your physical body, to your family, to your mind. Even, even mental torture is a kind of violence, not exact violence, but a kind of violence. So, you know, but that's not hurt. Let's, we have to make these two things separate. You know, violence and uh, versus the sentiments. Offending somebody's sentiments is, has, is and should always be under the free speech principles. But 
uh, threatening somebody uh, bodily harm or anything like that that should be completely no go for a free speech that does not come under free speech so that's my take on it and i would like to end it with a quote which is your right to have free speech ends where my sorry your right to raise your fist in the air ends where my nose begins so you can wave your fist in your in my face in my in front of me and that's part of your free speech but don't touch my nose with your fist that's it but wouldn't you call that a threat sorry wouldn't you call that a threat waving your waving my fist in your face would would wouldn't you call that a threat so if if you classify no, as that as, as a as threat as long as person is not saying along with the action as long as the person is not saying that i am going to kill you i am going to harm you it's fine see free speech is all about words you know what you say in the visual media or writing or anything or or your or with your words so those words don't have to be threatening enough for anybody to take a physical harmful action if it in inside somebody take a hurtful action that's part of free speech if it inside somebody take a harmful action that's wrong so basically we can all agree that there should be a line of course now, the dispute would be where where that line is yeah line like the the crudest example that i can give i mean where the line gets blurred is shouting fire 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 in a crowded theater now if somebody is shouting fire would you run or would you just stand there listen to that person and imagine that there is no threat or or is there an actual threat ruthwij what would you do in such a situation i would run you would run without looking whether there is a fire or not omar what would you do yeah i would also run on the off chance that there is actually a fire so Uh, i might uh, you know later reflect upon it but uh, of course saving life is important so yeah that example is there and we can all uh, but we can all agree that it is about expressing oneself and that yeah. hurt sentiment thing uh, cannot be taken into account uh, but like i said in the beginning that uh, free speech is uh, essentially a fundamental part of any healthy democracy and dissent is a very uh, crucial part of any healthy democracy so when we look at india and uh, i think the question is uh, directed to uh, ruthwij that you know when we look at india you th- you think that are we moving forward when it comes to free speech or the or are we moving backward every day do you think there is a uh, you know censorship on the way we are expressing ourselves so the answer for this is not really uh, that straightforward because free speech has been quite a bit restricted i mean beyond the limits which i am personally con- comfortable with since independence in- including in- even our first amendment brought in restrictions for, for uh, free speech so the it's not that legally there is a uh, big change when as far as free speech goes but Uh, as a society i think we were much more tolerant at that time to hurt emotions so maybe this is with the advent of social media and ability for people to express themselves without having access uh, in other i mean to a wider media uh, wider mass without having access to is it is it also because of the uh, that the has increased sorry is it also because of the bjp that the tolerance has increased i am not sure about that but it's possible i mean B- i mean bjp has in a way uh, brought in that uh, nationalism i mean they have uh, raved up this nationalism narrative quite a, a high tone and with, which may be because of which uh, i mean because of that people might be get, getting more and more intolerant with anything which they perceive as anti national and then um, saying wrong things about a na- national hero i mean that would be but then this idea was also there with congress to some extent that congress would uh, congress rarely tolerated uh, anything against gandhi ji and nehru 
But I have never seen so this I, I, kind so, of. So, Ruthin, I differentiate of, between the two uh, things. I, I sorry, sorry to interrupt you for just a minute. I I differentiate between the two things. One is about nation, which, which has no personal motive there. Uh, it, it, nation is for everyone, right? Whoever is a citizen. So if they are stopping somebody from deriding your nation, that goes for everyone without any prejudice. But the in the other case, if somebody is deriding somebody's family, that's that's a prejudice, right? That's that's you are stopping somebody to talk about one particular family. No, not necessarily. So there, there also there would be a line as talking about someone's family's personal lives and talking about their political life. So if you're talking about Nehru's contributions to the nation and criticizing his actions as a prime minister, then I think that's perfectly acceptable. But uh, the kind of propaganda that BJP runs against Nehru is, I think, breaching into the personal lines. And that I, I find unacceptable on this oh level. That the personal attacks are not acceptable, but the... Uh, Public, but their public work is within the purview of free speech. Okay, so uh, so when we talk about uh, Indian democracy and Indian society, and uh, like Ruthvid said that uh, if, if there are two different things when we are talking about any person. So now the question is that the Indian society, the way uh, we see things are going how people are being uh, harassed sometimes uh, online and even uh, physical harm uh, happens to them over some jokes. So on one hand, uh, it happens for religious reasons. And nowadays, uh, globally also, uh, there is a section from the left uh, that has uh, began attacking people for uh, jokes and expressing themselves. So do you think in India, which one is the bigger threat? The, the religious moral policing or the, the left uh, brigade that is suddenly uh, you know, protecting, instead of protecting, they are also attacking the, the free speech. So Rajesh, what do you think? Uh, what, how does the future look like to you? Yeah, according, according to me, whoever is in power, the, the problem that we have, the issue that we have with limitations on free speech, does not change. As Ruthwij also pointed out earlier, when we were talking about nationalism versus the family thing. You see, there was a cartoonist, I remember, uh, some Mishra, I think. No. Somebody who was arrested under the Congress rule. And uh, then there is Kamlesh Tiwari who said Allah is gay and he is languishing in jails. And then he died. or I think he died, yeah. Then So, yeah. so there have been issues like that under every government, whoever. And uh, in even now, when you're speaking about comedians, Recent example has been this of uh, Agrim Joshua, this woman in, uh, who supposedly calls herself a stand-up comedian, but who made her life out of making jokes in the bars, you know, a place where actually people who are drunk and they would laugh at even if you fart, right? So, so those, so it, it's a place for the crass jokes. You know, if, even if you find jokes or comedians crass, that is the place for crass jokes. So she has the right to make crass jokes there. Now, that beside the point, she said something, she used to make fun all the time about BJP and Modi and whatever, you know, and nothing happened to her. One time she made a joke about Maratha, Sh Shivaji and all. And the trolls, troll on, uh, army online got on to her and, uh, and then she complained to Aditya Thakre that this is BJP troll Sena, which is, uh, you know, after her. Two days later, everybody got to know that it was not the BJP, it was the Shiv Senex. And so it's a comedy of errors that she complained to Aditya Thakre only about the Shiv Senex. And then that is why she had to apologize to Aditya Thakre for it. So the problem here is, I don't think any, any of her free speech was muzzled. She said whatever she wanted to. and uh, But the problem was, and then the threats came to her. You know, there was somebody who was a right wing and then he gave threats and he's arrested. And that's fine. He should be arrested because... He that is not under the purview of free speech. You know, he's threatened a harm on somebody. But she should not be arrested, and her she has not been arrested. So I don't think any of her free speech is muzzled. So sometimes we exaggerate things also, you know, in the sense that uh, somebody saying telling you to stop saying what you are saying 
is also part of free speech. You know, that is his free speech to tell you to stop whatever he doesn't like. And that's fine. As long as you are not threatened harm or as long as you are not arrested for your words, it's all part of free speech. I agree largely with what Rajesh has said that as long as uh, I mean everyone has a right to say whatever they want as long as they are not uh, planning to harm someone or threatening and harm or inciting so these are the three things which I think are beyond the purview of free speech actual harm threatening and harm and uh, inciting and harm. Omar, Omar, a lot of time people think that threatening to get somebody arrested is muzzling of free speech. Do you, do you think that is so? Like, for example, um, you said something and I threatened to get you arrested for whatever you said because I find it offensive and, and that is like muzzling your free speech. Do you think it is muzzling of free speech? I think uh, when we say free speech, it also means that uh, you know, I my I should be ready to face the consequences also, and I should uh, know the the law. The world does not work according to my wish and command. So, uh, if if there is a law, even if I disagree with it, if there is a law that can get me arrested, and if someone is trying to use that law to get me arrested, so I think him trying to get me arrested. Uh, does not muzzle my free speech. It only uh, shows that he does not like what I say. Yeah, but if he comes and says that if I if you say it, I will kill you, and I will. So I think that that muzzles my free speech. But I think law and order, if law and order is preserved and maintained, and if we fight it out in court, so I think that that is uh, how civil uh, societies should function. Now, uh, the, the core mm. thing reminds just, me... Just one thing, uh, um, Umar. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Just one question on what you said. What if that law is unjust? As in, say, tomorrow a government comes, into, comes to power and which says key, criticizing us is illegal. Now, you know that criticizing the government is illegal. So, be, even, I mean, the law is totally undemocratic in that sense. So would would you still say that, I mean, if it's a law, it's a law? No, of course. Like I said that, you know, there not all laws are just also. For example, in, in Indian constitution, uh, I do not agree the, with the blasphemy thing, for example. So uh, the thing is that, of course, it is, uh, and it is a law that actually curtails my individual liberty and I disagree with it. But what I'm saying is that if a person, if, if a law exists and if a person is saying that I will use that law against you. So I think, uh, of course, in a way, it, it curtails my free speech also. But if I know that law exists, so practically, not ideally, practically, I might have to be careful. So that's what I'm saying. I would like to also answer, respond to what Ruthwej asked, Omar. So Ruthwej, if uh, if we if uh, some country, a democratic country, makes a law which is authoritarian, right? We are so basically we are turning an authoritarian country because you know we made a law which is uh, like for example you said criticizing their own government is unlawful, right? Then we are not a democracy because if it is a democracy, then it cannot be passed unanimously. It cannot be passed with the vote, that kind of law. If it is passed, then we are not a democracy any longer. We are moving towards authoritarianism. And once we start moving toward that direction, the free speech will obviously be muzzled. That goes without saying. That reminds me, interestingly, that reminds me that uh, back in 2019, when we talk about Indian government and the curtailing of uh, individual liberty and free speech, a very interesting amendment was made to RTI. And that amendment uh, gave the government the power to uh, change the tenure of chief information commissioner mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, affect their salaries. Or, and it was very controversial last year. And it uh, seemingly gave the government the power to 
uh, indirectly influence the RTI indirectly, even uh, you know threaten or something. Uh, the Chief Information Commissioner CIC, which was not earlier. So, Ruthvis, do you think that under this government, uh, there is a threat to free speech or uh, something like that, or we are moving in, in that direction somehow? I would say yes to some extent. Uh, that is, I mean, there is an increasing threat that uh, th this government will try and make laws which are basically muzzling any kind of transparency. For example, I mean, to go get into the transparency part, if you remember, I think uh, three budgets back, there was an announcement for uh, electoral bonds. Now, since 90s, we have been undergoing an, uh, uh, reforms in electoral processes, which has increasingly made uh, electoral finances transparent. Like you have to uh, reveal source of uh, your uh, donations, if it's more than 20,000, then there were, there were restrictions on cash and so on. Now, what this law does is anyone can pay whatever amount they want to any particular party. And it will be completely anonymous. I guess, so I, guess we are, I guess we are digressing. Um, this no, has so, nothing to do with so the free speech, actually. No, no, I'm not. Uh, so that's what I'm coming back. So okay. That way, this government has been trying to muzzle transparency in the uh, electoral process, which comes to the democ democracy part. But yeah, as Rajesh said, this is quite a bit off the topic right now. Okay, so I will ask a question to, back to both of you in a similar fashion, bringing the thing back to track. Do, you, do either of you think that uh, this government is muzzling free speech or or this government has done any better than the last governments in free speech matter? Uh, you can start. Omar, okay, okay, so, yeah. So, like I gave the example, like I gave the example of uh, RTI amendment, first of all. So, that is uh, a negative thing, according to me. And uh, secondly, uh, there have been instances when uh, people have been arrested, you know, and uh, uh, for uh, registering their dissent towards government policies. And there are many uh, instances when that has happened. So I think the people who have been arrested to uh, disrupt while they were disrupting law and order and uh, threatening uh, public property or burning. So I think uh, that makes sense. But there are uh, some examples. Uh, I, for example, Kafil Khan, for example. So I, I have not come across any statement from him uh, uh, that so and, and many more examples, maybe. So I think uh, there is a, a growing uh, not on, not by the government, but uh, the sentimentals, uh, the, the sentimentality of the people uh, that is moving towards a, a phase where it might get difficult even more to criticize and uh, express oneself. So that is what I think. Ruthwij, what do you think? And Ruthwij? Uh, in my opinion, officially, there is to uh, some extent, but not as much as uh, the, I mean, uh, the narrative says, but there is certainly there at the, uh, the this issue is certainly uh, there at the unofficial level where Trolls are being used to muzzle free speech. Now, there is no evidence whether, that trolls are being used by the government. So we are just talking about the government right now, not the society part. No, but if if someone comes to the, comes to me and says that you can't talk against the BJP, otherwise you, I will do this too, yeah, or so I will that's do that. That's his personal view. That's not BJP's view, or that's not government view, right? But that's my point. This is this is unofficially being done now. How do I know that this troll is not actually being paid by BJP to uh, muzzle free no, speech? But nobody so knows, BJP and there is no evidence to prove that either. But that's my point. But that's what I'm saying. There is no evidence which connects that troll to BJP, and which is the only reason we, you can't say officially that BJP is muzzling free speech. But at unofficial level, if you are, if some, anyone even unofficially, is trying to muzzle your free speech, ultimately you are going to hold the party responsible. Just like if someone uh, muzzling free speech against, say, Gandhi Nehru Parivar is going to, you are going to hold it against Congress, that Congress should come out and say, no, this is unacceptable. 
Congress should stop but that. I'm sorry to say this. There's this, this, this a complete different thing happening here. Okay, let me try to bifurcate this. On one hand, we are talking about BJP and the Congress. On BJP front, we are talking. We are. We all agree, and I think we are. We are saying same thing that government is not doing anything directly, or, or at least the go direct government officials are not saying, not threatening anybody. The uh, laws against free speech or muzzling people's free speech, but it is the uh, fear that has been created by people who support BJP, right? Do we agree on that, Rudhvish? Right. Yes. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, whatever is happening in the Congress, like for example, the Agrim Joshua thing. I mean, the Shiv Sena is in with the Congress there in Maharashtra. Then the other thing is with Sanjay Jha. He has been chucked out, suspended from Congress for saying his words. You know, whatever he said, uh, because he just said that he is not supportive of one family or one person. He supports the ideology of Congress and he was chucked out for saying that. So he, one on one part, there is an official muzzling of free speech. On other side, it is the fear that we can muzzle your free speech, right? That's the, that's the difference. Yeah, right, so, right. Yeah. So, so, who, so who is doing worse, according to you, Ruthwaj? I would still say it's the BJP. Now, uh, hear me on on this. What happened with Sanjay Jha was basically an internal party matter, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Because because party provides a forum internally to uh, dissent against party policies. So he can say whatever he wants at a party plenary meeting, and say, I mean, I don't want to support one family. I will vote. He can ask. Uh, he uh, whenever there are party presidential elections, he can contest those elections. If he has uh, enough support within the party, he can certainly win. But when you go to a public forum and represent your party, you have you are expected to follow party discipline. So tomorrow, if party says that you what, cannot what I, okay, go okay, and I, sorry, Ruthwich, sorry to interrupt you, Ruthwich. What I'm trying to say is okay. I, I I think I did not make myself clear. Let's make a clear. Uh, distinction about case of Sanjay Jha versus Subramanian Swami. I mean, Subramanian Swami is a person who talks all the time against his party, all the time, openly, and nobody says anything to him. Is that more democratic and is that, okay, forget about democracy, is that more supportive of free speech or what happened to Sanjay Jha is more supportive of free speech? I would say what happened to Subramanian Swami is more supportive of free speech right right so but, but the thing is that uh, we cannot uh, uh, compare uh, bjp and congress because because bjp government is running the country and it is directly affecting the policies so i think uh, there there is there lies the difference and i remember when it comes to congress the problem is that what is happening inside the congress within congress is a threat to indian democracy because we need a healthy opposition. We need a very strong opposition for a healthy democracy. And yeah. what is happening inside Congress, it is making more and more people disenchanted with the Congress policies and looking at them as one party dynasty. And despite Congress uh, having some really grand leaders at, the, at its foundation, but today it is reduced to one party. So I think and the if if the reform within congress does not happen and it keeps chucking people out it is only going to hurt india in the long run and it is going to be a threat to indian democracy do you agree rajesh i absolutely i absolutely, absolutely agree that whatever congress is going through right now yes they need a complete uh, manthan and you know some nectar has to come out of it but i think they are doing it the wrong way they should have been gone in the opposite direction. They should have uh, disowned the Gandhi family and taken out others, you know, tall leaders from the Congress at the helm of the party to put them at the helm of the party. And uh, then they can nurture new talent and stuff like that, go to the grassroots and that. Right now, they are not doing any of that. They are just protecting whatever is left. That's exactly what they are doing. Salvaging, not even protecting, they're salvaging whatever is left. And uh, that's not the right. They are not even doing that. In my opinion, they are not even doing that. Sorry. <laughs> and, 
uh, in my opinion, they are not even doing that. Frankly speaking, I don't know what exactly they are doing. <laughs> Nobody knows what exactly they are doing. They are probably just uh, gathering a few supporters of Gandhi families, and then they will have some party out of that. I don't know. Yeah, for example, uh, uh, Sindhya was a very uh, prominent leader, and uh, uh, what happened with such a pilot is also disappointment for Congress, and then Sanjay Jha, and the list goes on. So I think if they do not, uh, you know, get their stuff together uh, within uh, within uh, you know few months or so, we don't know where the country is going towards, and it will only hurt the the for the the principle of democracy in India. So that is what I'm worried about. See, the problem with Congress was that they had too many people, and they have ruled uh, India for so many decades. So they had complete. set up who will take over suddenly you know if they win the election they can who can take over center and they had complete set up to take over in each and every state state as well now people who were supposed to work in the center are completely idle for almost like 7 years and uh, you know two elections have passed and probably third one also they are going to lose even worse so basically the people who were supposed to be part of the cent, uh, cent, uh, set up of center are sitting idle and want power sharing in the state but now two you know two swords cannot stay in one uh, thing and uh, mm-hmm. so that that's the, that's where the power struggle is happening in every state where congress is ruled by you know uh, people who, there are people there are people who who are supposed to rule the state and there are people who are supposed to be part of the center so that power is shared among everybody and everybody is happy but sindhya is not happy that there was uh, this guy in uh, Madhya Pradesh and Sachin Pilot is not happy because Gailot is in there, so you know that kind of tussle is going on, and I don't think Congress is coming to power in center any soon. Uh, and as far as states are concerned, this kind of tussles will keep happening, and they are they will keep on losing the ground. The other problem is that they are supporting the old guards, not the young blood. You know, the, while they should have gone the opposite way and supported the young blood instead of the old guards. and they are still continue to doing that and that's a big problem for them big problem and since we're talking about it um i actually could not follow what happened with the whole sachin pilot episode i mean he had no intention of joining the bjp but i think he suspended from congress also so if you can enlighten me uh, rutwij or if you have been following what actually happened i haven't been following that as much but from what i understand uh, i mean what you said i mean that's the gist of it he was not happy with uh, rajasthan congress and that's why he's leave i mean uh, he rebelled against the uh, rajasthan government and for that he was suspended from the party but so that's i mean if you come to think of it sachin pilot not joining bjp lends more cred- uh, credibility to his rebellion then sindhya's dash because what sindhi what what seems like the case with sindhya is that it's just a political opportunism i'm not getting power here so i will go there and get power let me let me okay. let me predict something and let me tell you rutwij what i think is this is going once this sachin pilot thing is over you will call him a worse traitor than sindhya why because he is not he might not join bjp directly but what he will do is he will form a government out with outside support to the bjp and that will be the worst than joining bjp no as far as i am concerned that would be the same as joining bjp but the, i mean my whole point on this is that as long as you are not joining bjp it doesn't look like a political opportunism as soon as you join hands with bjp it Yeah, no, it gets a completely on the other color. hand, it looks more like political opportunism because you are not joining BJP, you are sitting outside BJP and telling BJP that I will only join you when you give me this, 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 this. I will only support you from outside when you give me this, 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 whatever, whatever it is. Internal demands. That's the same thing. Be, that's, that's more of thing. a political opportunism rather. Because. see my uh, i have always said that within congress this old guard has this uh, dirty habit of not giving any space not ceding any space 
to the youth and that just means i mean the uh, current paying a state price that for that, yeah. the current state that congress is in is partly because of that because there was a vacuum created as old guard mm-hmm. starts moving out no new leaders are in, there in existence because they never give space to the new leaders and this it's vacuum is where space to the new leader omar what do you think about this i mean bjp is more pragmatic on this front you know is if if they cannot share a power with a youth per, with a young person but at least they will give him full power to speak whatever he wants to speak you know so at least his yeah. his ideas are out there you know for example even in technology bjp has been at the forefront of adopting new technologies every day even modi speaks about you know how uh, he is at uh, adapting technology in uh, let laptops and you know networks and everything like that so mm. i feel their leaders even their old leaders support if if they don't directly support share power with the young people they at least support the ideas coming from the young people more than what congress does the the reason behind the success of bjp i think is that that uh, no matter what their uh, commitment to a democracy is outside of the party inside the party it is very democratic right they have a change of party presidents a long list of party presidents and anyone can assume power within the party and grow in ranks so i think that is why uh, they they have been successful at the center and that is something that congress should learn uh, that you know people who are working hard sachin pilot has worked really hard on the ground for many years he has given a lot to the party and still he was not made the cm because congress has this weird fascination with uh, fossils who <laughs> with who are uh, you know in uh, lived their tenure lived their life but somehow they are, are still at the helm of affairs and even if they have proven not to be worthy they have proved not to be worthy but still they are party president again and again so i think if if they, this is something to learn uh, from from bjp and they they might you know some people say that they are a threat to democracy bjp is a threat to democracy by appealing to majoritarianism this might or might not be true but what they do inside the party is something to look at and uh, so so that is what i think and uh, uh, if, if it doesn't happen i think we are moving at a very uh, you know difficult time as a country if people don't understand that Rutvesh, do you think we are looking at uh, difficult times ahead or better times ahead in terms of Indian democracy and both free speech? I think we are looking at uh, more and more difficult times as we move ahead, because this, as Uma said, that while BJP is internally quite demo, I mean more democratic as compared to Congress, there is an issue of this hyper majoritarianism, hyper nationalism. which is in a way muzzling free speech currently and i mean outside the party and as a i mean i mean as a democracy that's muzzling free speech and which might lead to further issues down the line okay my view also, is a little different uh, than both of yeah. you i think we are doing wonderful in terms of free speech as compared to past times i mean i think we are living in the best times where at i mean i'm not in the idealistic times where you know absolutely everything is free speech is uh, completely allowed or at least tolerated but uh, we are in compared to last 70 80 years of india we are living in the best times where we can, where anyone can speak whatever they want without the facing the repercussions yes if i mean if, if talking about gods or talking about sedition seditious uh, things might be there is a blur line blur there but uh, other than that i don't think any bjp is interested in arresting anybody or you know or or putting in prison somebody who said something against the party or modi or whatever i mean people as people have been speaking against modi since day one every day he is a dog he is this he is that they have been saying all kind of shit every day i mean every day on twitter he is the most abused person in india right now but still nothing who has been jailed yeah. nobody but kind of free speech rajesh has already been in an existence for past i mean since our independence we had this kind of free speech to criticize the government so sorry i didn't understand what you're saying some, this kind He's of free that... speech to 
criticize the government or the uh, criticize the politicians has always been there there were a few blips like if you take a uh, take emergency for example there yeah, have so been then i don't blips, understand what, kind of, so then i don't understand in what context we are losing free speech we are not losing free speech no i was saying that we are moving to like this time. and if it, this is also same then how are we losing free speech we are not no uh, let me let me uh, put my point here that uh, when i said that we are moving towards difficult times it was not only politically but i think uh, we indians have a weird way of looking at free speech because there are so many groups and religions and faiths that instead of saying that we have to uh, express and uh, uh, make jokes on all the groups we say that if you can cannot make against that group then you cannot yeah. make a joke against yeah. my group also so instead of saying that let's make a joke against every group you know so this is a problem that this is the friction that i see increasing and so there uh, is no you, there is no uh, standard for freedom of speech basically that's the problem everybody defines yeah. their own standard as per their own group power whatever they will yeah so i think uh, we can conclude by now uh, ruthwij has something to say yeah so then we can conclude yeah so what i was saying is uh, as uma said it's not just the political aspect of it what hap- what's happening right now is as a society we are moving towards more and more muzzling of free speech so what I, so to give you an example if you say suppose if you are criticizing one leader and someone comes and threatens your free speech that's still muzzling your free speech now the other group is going to retaliate on this so again they will sorry i didn't i didn't catch you what did, what did the sorry ruthwish i didn't catch you uh, what did you say in the beginning if you were saying something against some leader or something and then somebody threatens you with what someone threatens you to stop speaking against that leader that's muzzling that's your free speech that's not a threat but that's not a threat that's his free speech also he's no. asking you to stop speaking that's his free speech right that no, he's not if that's it's not a threat, threat. It's, a, it's if it's a threat then that's muzzling free speech so i'm talking specifically about threat for example okay. what happened with okay. somebody Kofi. tells you he will break your legs if you speak against the person right ha huh. so that's a, that's muzzling free speech now the now this now say this is the right which is doing this, this kind of muzzling now there is again a counter reaction from the left where they will start muzzling free speech in some other way so now you have examples of doxing which is in a way muzzling free speech then the, uh, uh, there is cancellation this, no that's uh, not muzzling yeah. of free speech that's not muzzling of free speech that may be unethical but that's not muzzling of free speech forcing I mean, some forcing some cancel an event by cre- by creating threats that's a muzzling of free speech how so so this so this kind of reactions and counter I mean, reactions somebody taking is, away somebody taking away platform from you where you gave your free speech or where you want to give your free speech somebody taking away that platform from you is not muzzling of free speech they are just taking away the platform they are not stopping you so from forcing? saying something what about forcing forcing someone to take away that platform how I, give me an example what is what do you mean by forcing someone to take away the platform for example you say now in case of agrima joshua there was uh, some kind of vandalism which had happened i don't so know vandalism band- i'm only i was only talking about her free speech whether she had the right to say whatever or not but no but then if threats of vandalism exist that if you go ahead with this program we will uh, we will destroy your property we will do this we will do that this kind of yeah, that is are, of course that's a threat that's a threat so so this so the, my point is this that there are reactions and counter reaction one person reacts that no this is not free speech this should be curtailed the other side says no this is also not free speech this should also be curtailed so no, this no, kind we were, of see, ruthwich we were talking about the cancel culture you were talking about cancel what if left also starts cancel culture and this kind of stuff deplatforming people that's not that's deplatforming that's not muzzling of free speech no but my point is that that 
left can make can make threats of vandalism and say ki no if the, uh, if this person is speaking we will vandalize your property we will destroy your property we will prevent this program from happening and that's muzzling free speech are you saying let yeah, left yeah. has not been doing it already they they already do it all over the world they do it yeah so that's like right forming it's, it's, so it's not reactionary it's not a reactionary thing to a right that you know right did something so we will also start doing this no they have already been oh, doing it no. they have done it in russia no. they have done it in china they have done it in us in uh, scandinavian countries they have done it in india as well you are missing in my point my point is not that right is doing it and then the left is reacting my simple point i'm making is one side does this the other side reacts of in course. a counter and way so all people are saying they that's exactly what omar said earlier that we have a weird sense of freedom of speech in india intolerant and that's what omar said earlier instead of all groups saying that we can speak against all groups whoever i want other than, rather than that what we do is okay you speak against us so we will do this against you, you know, that's how we are weird uh, freedom of speech is in india so so in freedom of speech in india in that sense as a society because we are failing to grasp what it means we are failing to yeah. grasp the concept of free speech what it means we think that uh, free speech means i i can say whatever i want only i can say whatever i want that is free speech so so that is a very flawed understanding and when we say that other person also has the right to express they find it hard to grasp how can someone else has the same right as me because i am right and you are wrong because yeah. they do not understand that right and wrong has nothing to do with free speech you can be as wrong you can be a flat earther but you have all the right to uh, say whatever you want so i think that is a very flawed understanding and uh, in order to preserve this uh, this feature this principle i think it is important for people uh, who understand this to tell people that this means saying anything and everything whether you agree with it or not against every group so i think that is uh, that is how i would uh, conclude my point rajesh you have I will, I will conclude and uh, i will also say add one more point i had just a thought uh, you know a lot of times what happens is for example somebody said something and he is threatened with an arrest you know by social media trolls or by any official party member also or or actually a case has been filed now people assume it to be a muzzling of free speech this is i i think this is where i have what i have figured is where the problem is why the weird sense of freedom of speech is there see the the sense of freedom of speech among people changes only after enough number of court judgments have come to suppress something or to encourage something now in regard to freedom of speech we have not reached that level because we take law in our own hands we threat people or we you know whatever we think that we can handle it rather than law should handle it and in that process the police the arrest comes in the middle of it you know the courts come later or the threats come before that so middle court so we should rather encourage people to file reports against people whoever you find offense against you know rather than taking law in our own law in our own hands by muzzling their free speech or threatening them or anything just file a report and then uh, there are other side of pe- people who think that if somebody filed a report is a muzzling of free speech no it's not muzzling of free speech that's how the law should be that's how people should behave that's how things should go and the matter should go the court to go to the court court should decide that this did not violate the freedom of speech principles and this is allowed enough number of judgments pile upon each other like that and then we we will soon see that whole society understand what freedom of speech is so we need to encourage people to file more uh, reports against people who whoever you find offensive okay rutwej you have something yeah, to i comment. quite agree with i quite agree with rajesh on that so i would just like to conclude with one quote there's a movie called the american president in which at the end there is a quote which is given Hey, America is a difficult uh, is a difficult thing. Let us see you defend the right of a person to say something which you would spend your life defending. Or 
to say something which makes your blood boil but still you defend the right of that person to say that and that is that is the real essence of free speech that uh, once you want free speech you need to seize free speech to others as well yeah so we all agree that free speech you know uh, free speech means nothing at all until and unless it is given to the people whom we disagree with completely correct perfectly said i think we all agree on this and how free speech is the foundation of any liberal civil society and i hope we everybody understands that and uh, thank you ruthwij for joining it has been enlightening and enriching experience to talk with you once again and we will surely invite you one more time later whenever we have some uh, topic of our common interest and thank you everyone for joining and uh, thank you for watching choosing the red pill the 10th episode thank you everyone thank you viewers thank, thank you sir. omar and ruthwij for uh, joining us on choosing the red pill episode 10 where we discuss freedom of speech and state of indian democracy uh, thank you ruthwij for i hope uh, some of our viewers might get educated from whatever we discussed today and especially what you said and so yeah so great discussion thank you let's keep it going thank you bye bye thanks